departure. I stood motionless beside you, black wool coat, black clothing. The room smelled metallic, metal hospital bed, metal pans for vomit, urine. Your swollen arm hung heavy from a ceiling hook. Morphine fell like leisurely drops of rain. Your face, angel white, tufts of lost hair on your pillow. I put my ear to your mouth, heard a deep, inhuman sound, a faint whisper, time for me to go. O oh, Holy Mother, devout until surrender, did you walk that dark tunnel? Did you step into the light? Thank you. Unfit. If I disappeared, the problem disappeared with me. Fifteen, three months pregnant, dropped at the door of the new Hope Maternity Home, bleak brick building, high spiked fence, closed curtains. Rehabilitation, they called it, a boarding school for wayward girls. Enforced confinement, fitting punishment for my crime, part patient, part criminal, enclosed in the idea it is in the best interests of the child. My name was changed, everything removed that would remind me of who I was. Rigid schedules, discipline, lectures, words like loose, bad, unfit, unwed, shame, illegitimate. Notes on all bassinets read, mother does not want to see baby. Papers were signed, a death without a body. Sent back to a life I had outgrown, you will forget just put it behind you. Don't dwell on it. Never speak of it. Just pretend nothing happened. Survival depends on denial. A lifetime shadowed by sadness. Grief stays stuck in the body. Secrets embedded like gravel under my skin. A wound that festers never heals. Thank you. I wrote uh, two about uh, a Celtic maiden named Olwen. Her uh, name translates loosely as a white footprint, a white track, and wherever she walked, the, foot, the flower grew, sort of like a Persephone cross-culturally. Olwen, it's a sonnet. Soft asleep near rhythmic rising sea, in tender bracelet arms, sweet Olwen swells. Wordless breathing, blood inspires within me. Yet fate distills this dream, I waken spells. The brightest eye, a serpent rings this moon. Lay gently on the land, my source upwelled. I brace myself against the dimming loom. Am I the child that I as father held? Hard my ancient life, whirl of cyclic wind. This three score nine to bide his honored guest. Sea foam breaks as flowers upon her skin, myself descending veils upon her breast. Owen oh, swells, becomes these cyclic swells. The child in me, this self flesh child, dispels. That's all, uh, Owen. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. <laughs> Second one is also old one. I, did, I just wrote it, I didn't, really didn't change the name, but. Uh, it's about a slacker sleeping underneath a tree, and in his dreams, uh, you see the woman of his dreams walking towards him, and he needs to get on, a, get on the ball. But she won't make it easy for him. She wants him to build a house, and it has to be done just so. Oh, and at rest from the sun do I dream neath a tree. In the guise of a maiden, time walks towards me. Within each sure footfall, like snowflakes on glass, white visitations that humble the grass. Stems, they are raising their petals so fair. Some find the way to a bow in her hair. Follow white footprints that wend to a door that I've yet to build, neither walls, roof, nor floor. Uh, she turns away from a man incomplete. Wake now, I must, ere another she'll greet. Hasten, I shall, to gather stones white that tumbled from temples when gods took to flight. Then lay a foundation, deep, sure, and true. Lintels and mantles and hearth I then hew. I'll frame then a home from the bones of a whale that followed the kill, sure to bleach in the veil. At rest from my labors I dream neath a tree. 
a floral path halts his sweet progress towards me. Uh, she'll turn away from a house incomplete. Wake now I must ere another she'll greet. A roof from the weather that's woven from wheat, reaped from the meadow that floats on the peat. The walls to be plastered with Avalon clay, firm with the mane of a king's bloody bay. Window sash gilt with the sun's morning dew, panes cleft from diamonds and sapphires of blue. Dare I not rest neath the light of the moon, for I shall awaken alone from that swoon. She'll turn away from a life incomplete, rally I must ere another she'll greet. I'll sink a wide well that's as deep as the sea, sweetened like honey for afternoon tea. Then alter the course of a cool mountain stream to water the garden and nurture a dream. I'll scour my furrows with teeth from a hair, a bountiful harvest for her I'll prepare. A kettle I'll fashion from Aries war drum, a harp of fine heather for her I will strum. She'll turn away from a man incomplete, labored have I, lest another she'll greet. At rest from my worries, I dream neath a tree, in the guise of a maiden, time walks towards me. Within each sure footfall, like snowflakes on glass, white visitations that humble the grass. Stems they are raising their petals so fair, a few found their way to a bow in her hair. Follow white footprints that went to a door that I have since built before walls, roof, and floor. The promise of spring at my door I do greet. I've turned away from a life incomplete. Thank you. I'm going to be reading um, from something that I, was, that I had written a while back. It's a book called Aha, Epiphanies to Release the Spirit Within. Uh, for those of you that are into epiphanies, writing or listening or trying to make them come alive, I have some available at the back. And I was inspired by Cheryl's email to me to read from a particular chapter on Mother Earth. She said, think spring. She didn't have to tell me to think spring these past few days or even earlier. I was out there with people with their shorts and flip-flops and letting that breeze blow through my hair. Still enjoying it too. Looking forward to more, I'm sure you are. So I'm reading from Mother Earth. Tune in to Mother Earth. And the epiphanies go. The sunrise and the sunset. Gifts without a price tag. Risk. Even nature risks saying spring too soon. An ethereal moon and stars create harmony and stir our being in the same moment. Listen for a bird's sound of music, mimic its resonance, and enjoy the duet. Simple, pause and be thrilled by Mother Nature. Walk into a forest until there is a sense of oneness. Let the wind make your eyes water and your spirit soar. Mother Earth redeems us. When we protect her beauty, there is honor. The first flight of butterflies hints at the welcome of spring. Like the circadian rhythms of the ocean tides, let life's ebb and flow cleanse the soul. Nature walks beckon footprints to refresh our memory of Mother Earth's keepsakes. A rainbow is wondrous sky art, a glimpse of heaven on earth. Sunshine offers radiant energy and unimaginable bliss. An eagle 
soars above the odds? Why not you? And in the feisty spirits, uh, spirit, excuse me, of shamrocks and more, um, I'm still delighting in Bridget's circle and how it unfolded all of us still unfolds me and the rest of you that have read thus far. It's entitled, Yes. Yes. Oh, the eyes of March are upon us, lasses and lads. So, yes to the YouTube videos capturing zany parades and outrageous spirits of shamrock greenery. Yes to St. Patrick who shared the shamrock of Trinity and always Bridget. Perhaps inspiring the divine resonance of Irish bagpipes and drums. Oh, the eyes of March are upon us, lasses and lads, so yes to the mystical lyrical songs of Irish blessings, whimsy, and a bit of the ruckus too. Yes to the artisans of Ireland's unspoiled green landscapes, seaside cliffs, and captured dreamscapes that enliven our souls. Oh, the eyes of March are upon us, lasses and lads, so yes to the zealous celebrators of St. Patty's Day with mischievous eyes of green or other hues. Yes to sporting the glitzy green exotica hair in Dublin Shannon, right here too. Oh, the eyes of March are upon us, lasses and lads, so Yes, to the festive eateries with endless Irish beef stew and a wee bit of the infamous bacon and cabbage. Yes, to the pubs with their outlandish greenery and spirited folks downing a pint or two. Yes, yes, yes. This poem is sort of, is not wintry. It's called A History of Peaches. First there was the tree, squat and fanned, like a perfect umbrella. But this was Massachusetts. Do peaches even grow here? That first summer, green fuzzy thimbles until August. September they hung like lanterns, tight ovals, not much bigger than golf balls. How do you gauge when to pick as you walk the lines between the worms, the grayish mold, and the squirrels? Some years there were hundreds, others ten. Once a raccoon tasted each hard green stone and pitched it to the ground. I have learned to pick early just the hard side of yellow. Wash and leave them to ripen indoors. Monitor or lose the fruit to mold. For a good harvest, I spend hours cooking, peeling, pitting, and sucking the warm meat off pits. And, and this is called the art of shoveling. When you wake to the thick white quiet, don't despair. When you know it will take hours to remove the two foot and still falling shroud, maybe all day, don't shy from it. Before visualizing the entire driveway clear, and you sailing out in your car, open the garage door. From the dry floor, scoop up one shovelful and fling it where you will not drive or walk. Fling it in the air. When after half, a half hour, only a small square of black top has emerged and you have so much more, Start singing. It could be Yankee Doodle, 
You have earned just one feather. Before you start crying, you have no one to, you can call to help. Take out an audio book. War and Peace, or Catch-22, something that will do the shoveling for you. <laughs> when the plow truck comes by, tells you to get out of the way, and undoes your last hour's work, don't waste your shaking fists. Return the snow to the road when the truck is gone. <laughs> when your back starts to feel the strain of the shovel, mount your snowshoes. Be a piston, float and sink. Make troughs alongside your shovel area. Somewhere to throw the snow, a trap to catch it when it blows. Thank you very much. The title of this story is Silent Passages. It's a story about a boy and his dog. Jim never got over losing his dog. Pluto's disappearance hit my little brother in ways I hadn't imagined. Dad offered to buy him a new puppy, but Jim declined, saying he wasn't interested. He seemed content being dogless. Yet this was how he always responded to any loss. He shut down a part of himself. He did it when Tweet Tweet, the parakeet, died, and when his pony, Old Pink, had to be put to sleep. I found myself lingering around the house after Pluto was gone, staying close so I could watch my little brother. I tracked him with an attentive silence. He looked the same, dressed and sounded the same, but he wasn't the same. He was too young to see the dangers that lurked around Pluto's world, strangers and cars and hostile breeds. Even our uncle, Dad's brother, had suggested we shoot a rifle over Pluto's head to get the puppy used to gunfire so he could retrieve wild game. One day, sitting on the front stoop, I spotted Jim. His wistful eyes gazed over at me. I walked near him and said in a matter-of-fact voice, what are you thinking? He gave me a quizzical look. Remember how I used to rub Pluto's nose for good luck? The last time I saw him, his nose felt dry. Do you think he went off so I wouldn't see how sick he was? I nodded as if this not only seemed plausible, but that I was ready to reflect back to him whatever feelings and thoughts came into his little head. I bet Pluto is out there somewhere, and maybe he only comes out at night. Sits underneath a tree, listening for a friendly voice. I let this fantasy hover there between us, avoiding any small talk, wondering if I was really helping by diverting him from the unsayable truth. I wouldn't say Pluto had been anything special. He was a purebred, 100% retriever, who looked pathetic when getting a tummy rub legs waving frantically in the air. He would bound over to my freckle-faced brother and plant two big paws on Jim's shoulders as they gave each other high tens. When my brother got the measles, Pluto chased his shadow, spun, and bit his tail until Jim was feeling better. Once Pluto turned four, Jim proclaimed that his puppy was now officially a dog. I didn't see any real change in the blocky creature, that was still spooked by a lightning storm and trembled when it was windy or rainy. But Jim loved that Don dog. I think they would have gotten married if it were legal. <laughs> One Saturday, I devised a strategy where I suggested we go out on a search party, go to where the two of them had frolicked. He hesitated. I gave him this look, a look that said, I think I can help. He gave me a nod that said he still believed in Pluto's return. So we set out in silence. We headed away from our house, crossed a bridge, which took us to a place with untrimmed trees and fluttery yellow-colored reeds, out beyond the swaying flowers and rocks where a distant Monadnock stood. I wonder how Jim would react coming back to the landscape that still looked the same, 
the dirt roads, the stone walls, the wellhead where Pluto must have sniffed, deciding where to leave his golden tinkle. Jim darted ahead of me once a dirt path narrowed. He looked like a bird returning to its nesting place. I was feeling good about my plan, picturing my kid brother pulled along by Pluto, leading him away into a widened, unpredictable landscape, one my baby brother wouldn't have seen if not for this dog. I imagined them clambering up a knoll, gravitating along the hills and streams, each one trying to get by the best they knew how. Once the path widened, he headed off the beaten path, his body perky and focused. He came upon a dried out beaver pond. I stopped a few feet away. I felt as if I no longer knew my brother. If someone had been looking down on us, seeing him in his world, and me following behind with my thoughts, it might have seemed like we each inhabited a separate border framed by the wider landscape. We found no signs of Pluto's whereabouts. After another hour of walking, we stopped by a catch meadow nestled along a hill. We thought we heard a half bark. When the two of us turned, the woods were still. I once came here with Pluto, said Jim. I stared over at his contorted face. It stunned me. I began, I became disappointed as he moved away on a path that narrowed. I wandered off by myself. I headed down the side of a hill, sliding along the rocks that brought me to the bottom. The shadowy stillness was broken by an eruptive light that fell on a rectangular object off to my left. I bent down. It was a dog identification tag. I hesitated, not sure of what I should do. I turned away as a numbing sensation blurred my mind. I gradually got, be got back to Jim. I don't think I want to come out here anymore, he said. My brother's voice, tentative, as, he, as we went back, the alertness and aliveness had vanished. I returned the next day. I was back to where Pluto's dog tag had glistened in the sunlight. I walked in a circle before noticing beetles milling about a creature's skeletal remains. I knew I couldn't leave the dog out there, so I gathered up what was left of Pluto and deposited his remains in a nearly obliterated cellar hole. I covered it with a canopy of twigs and branches. I hoped that Pluto was in a better place where maybe winged angels resembling a litter of puppies dance around him. I walked away thinking of the grief and loneliness and of the broken bond that had entered Jim's brief time on Earth. So I will share another story written by the Irishman who I know best, my husband Rick, um, from his second book called The uh, Greatest War Stories Never Told. Well, this one is from 1866. The Fenian Fiasco, as it is subtitled. The Day the Irish Invaded Canada. They came across the border the night of June 1st, an army of Irish-American nationalists, Fenians, as they called themselves, ready to fight and die to free Ireland from British rule. So what the heck were they doing in Canada? Well, their goal was to seize the British territory's major cities and use them as bargaining chips to negotiate with England for Ireland's independence. Clearer thinkers among them understood that this was far-fetched, but hoped that an invasion launched from American soil would start a war between the U.S. and Britain that would result in British troops being pulled out of Ireland. And so, 800 Irish-American soldiers, most of them Civil War veterans, crossed over from Buffalo and invaded Ontario. There was the 13th Tennessee Fenian Regiment, the 7th New York, the 18th Ohio, and others, and they planted the Fenian banner and hoped for the best. A regiment of Canadian volunteers confronted the Irishmen the next day in the Battle of Ridgeway. It was more of a glorified skirmish, really. It ended when the Fenians routed the Canadian volunteers with a bayonet charge. 
It was their first and only victory. With more Canadian soldiers coming, they skedaddled back to the U.S. where they were all promptly arrested. Another group of Fenians who crossed over from Vermont into Quebec were similarly unsuccessful. The bizarre invasion had more impact on Canada than on Ireland. It sparked a surge in Canadian nationalism that helped unify the provinces and lead to the creation of the modern Dominion of Canada. Irish independence would have to wait another 50 years. <laughs> I'm Dr. Kathy Phillips. And I'm Dr. Andrew Blum. Epilepsy is the third most common neurological disorder in the United States after Alzheimer's disease and stroke. It affects more than 3 million people, with 200,000 new cases diagnosed each year. The condition is caused by a temporary disturbance in brain function, resulting in various kinds of seizures. These seizures can produce involuntary movements, changes in awareness, altered behavior, or loss of consciousness. Epilepsy is a major chronic medical condition and can affect a person's quality of life similar to arthritis, heart disease, diabetes, or cancer. It can limit activity and cause pain, anxiety, or depression. It can also be life-threatening. Because epilepsy can also present non-medical challenges such as discrimination and social stigma, we urge you to learn more about this condition. To find out more about this disorder, including its symptoms, diagnosis, and treatment, visit epilepsyfoundation.org.